going on in obesity medicine right now in this exciting uh, time. Yeah. Very much, very exciting and very controversial as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Dr. Shapiro, before we start, you have to tell me what's whose statue is this? That is Bowman Gray, and he was the uh, gentleman who actually funded the medical school at Wake Forest many, many years ago. It was originally in, there is a Wake Forest, North Carolina, <clears throat> that's actually uh, fairly close to Raleigh. Mm -hmm. um, but it uh, it was his wish to uh, to bring it to Winston-Salem, <laughs> and, and he provided the money to do so. <laughs> Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, I think, the paintings and uh, statues of Benjamin Franklin that I have it seen. It does. In it is. It is very reminiscent. I agree. I think it's the glasses and the hairstyle. So <laughs> exactly. I was, I was thinking this was Ben Franklin. Yeah, it's a very distinguished look. All right, we are at 7.01, so I'm going to start. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to EMI Live. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Shapiro today. Dr. Shapiro is the inaugural Fred Parrish Professor of Cardiology and Molecular Medicine at Wake Forest University, where he's faculty in the section of cardiovascular medicine. After completing a cardiology fellowship, he spent uh, a couple of years at Massachusetts Journal doing a clinical and research fellowship focused on advanced cardiovascular imaging. And uh, he was also on faculty at the Knight Cardiovascular Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. Later on, he was the director of atherosclerosis imaging and associate director of the Center for Preventive Cardiology. And he's now director of the Center for Preventive Cardiology at Wake Forest Baptist Health. Um, he is well renowned in the areas of atherosclerotic imaging, lipid disorders, and preventive cardiology. And we are very fortunate to have him today. Dr. Shapiro, well, welcome to EMI Live. This is an initiative from the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology Department to um, have talks with renowned speakers like you and uh, to offer free CME to our uh, inside and um, external attendees and then put them on our YouTube channel. So, welcome and the floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Macon. I really appreciate the kind introduction, and it really it's a, an honor and privilege to be here with you this morning. I'm going to be talking about a topic that's very near and dear to my my heart, which is uh, the the whole discovery and translation of uh, PCSK9 and, and therapeutics that antagonize it. So I've titled the talk, Pushing the Envelope with PCSK9 and Beyond, 20 Years of Progress. Here are my disclosures. So to do some level setting, uh, I want to provide a basic framework for what I'll be discussing over the next 45 minutes, starting with the fact that small molecule therapeutics have really been the backbone of LDL cholesterol management since the 1980s when statins were first approved. But it's been the discovery of PCSK9 and the ensuing development as a target of therapy that's really transformed our ability to take care of even the most challenging patients with hypercholesterolemia and atherosclerotic risk. And now, as you will know, the first siRNA molecule has been developed and is approved to help lower LDL cholesterol. And it works different than the PCSK9 inhibitor antibodies. This prevents the production of PCSK9. And it's really, again, been a great advance in lipid lowering therapy. And towards the end of the talk, I'll really talk about some really exciting approaches to antagonizing PCSK9 that are in the pipeline and are likely to hit the clinic in the next years. So the first question you might ask is, we have statins, we have some other uh, uh, lipid lowering therapies. Why is it that we need additional lipid lowering therapies? Why are we spending another 45 minutes learning about some new drugs that lower LDL cholesterol? That's a very simple answer. Uh, when the statins were first approved, the first statin was approved in 1987, Lovastatin. Uh, there were some very high profile individuals, actually Nobel Prize laureates, who uh, prophesied that, um, in fact, that was the end of coronary disease. <laughs> Unfortunately, that prophecy has not uh, come uh, come true. As, as you'll know, uh, not only do, do we still have coronary disease as the leading cause of mortality in the world, uh, it actually falls short, the statins alone. So they are associated with 30 to 40 percent reduction in atherosclerotic events. Uh, but clearly they have not cured coronary artery disease. Uh, 
And so there's this notion that there's residual risk. That is the risk that remains after getting patients uh, to low LDLs with statin therapy. And um, the question has been, would one way of addressing this re residual risk be to get to lower and lower LDL cholesterols? And of course, this has been sort of uh, front and center for the last uh, decade and a half, I would say. And we're now in a very exciting time uh, in, in drug development, specifically in, in lipid management, uh, not only for LDL lowering therapies that we're going to be talking about today, uh, but also for triglycerides, for lipoprotein LA, it's really been a renaissance in preventive cardiology. So I think before I get into uh, the main topic of today, I, I just want to get everybody up to speed to how we understood cholesterol metabolism up until 2003. At that time, our understanding of cholesterol metabolism fell squarely within the cell. Everything you needed to know was actually happening only within the cell. So what this uh, cartoon is um, uh, demonstrating is um, LDL metabolism. So you have these LDL receptors on the surface of the cell. These are these uh, red structures here. An LDL particle that's carrying cholesterol binds to an LDL receptor. And that initiates receptor mediated endocytosis. So that LDL particle, LDL receptor complex is taken within the cell in an endosome and it travels within the cell. And progressively, the contents, the internal contents of the endosome become acidified because there's a proton potassium ATPase on the surface of these endosomes. And when the internal contents of the endosome uh, get to a critical low pH, there's actually a decoupling of the LDL particle from the LDL receptor. And it's a very neat system. The LDL receptor will actually recycle back to the surface of the cell where it can engage in ensuing rounds of clearing more LDL particles. And within the 24 hour lifespan of an LDL receptor, it can recycle about 100 to 150 times. So this is a very, very efficient system and it's very energetically favorable. So rather than the cell having to constitutively synthesize more and more LDL receptor protein, it simply just recycles back to the surface over and again. So as that's taking place, the LDL particle, which is still in the endosome, ultimately winds up fusing with the lysosome and is destroyed. And the cholesterol that's present in uh, the LDL particle is repurposed depending on the needs of the cell. And that was the basic understanding of a cholesterol metabolism. Now, much of what we learned about cholesterol metabolism was from individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia. You'll be aware that familial hypercholesterolemia is an autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia, and in the more common form, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, there's one damaged allele that's generally in the LDL receptor. That's the most common mutation. So in these individuals, they basically have half as many functional LDL receptors as an individual who doesn't have FH. And so they their ability to clear LDL from the blood is about half of that of uh, an unaffected individual. So generally, their LDLs are double of somebody without FH. And of course, if not identified and not treated in a timely fashion, these individuals wind up with very early aggressive atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, I bring this to your attention because in 2003, there was a French kindred. There was three French families who had very clearly autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia. Um, it, but when these individuals were sequenced, they didn't find any mutations in the LDL receptor gene or the ApoB gene, the ApoB is the other canonical gene that's associated with familial hypercholesterolemia. Of course, ApoB codes for an apolipoprotein B that's found on the surface of ath all atherogenic particles, which binds to the LDL receptor. So no mutations were found in these canonical genes, and they ultimately discovered that there was a mutation in a newly discovered protein called PCSK9, which now we know as the third locus for familial hypercholesterolemia. So uh, mutations in PCSK9 uh, were found in an autosomal dominant pattern associated with severe hypercholesterolemia, but it wasn't known at the time what it is that PCSK9 did. So there was obviously intense investigation after that discovery to try to unravel, uh, you know, the molecular biology of PCSK9. And as it turns out, PCSK9 is a low abundance plasma protein. It's primarily produced and secreted by hepatocytes into the circulation. And in fact, PCSK9 serves as a second ligand for the LDL receptor. So just as LDL particles bind to the LDL receptor, so too does PCSK9. The problem is when an LDL particle encounters an LDL receptor that is also bound by PCSK9, things go awry. The process starts exactly the same as I just demonstrated before. 
the LDL particle binds to the receptor. It triggers receptor mediated endocytosis. You have the endosome now carrying this ternary complex of LDL particle, LDL receptor, PCSK9. However, this is where things go bad. The PCSK9 prevents the decoupling of the LDL particle from the LDL receptor. So it interferes with the natural recycling loop that we, we just talked about. So now this whole complex of LDL particle, LDL receptor, PCSK9 is brought to the lysosome and all of it is destroyed. This has the effect of reducing the amount of LDL receptors that are now present on the hepatocytes. And so the ability to clear LDL from the circulation, of course, is impaired. This leads to hypercholesterolemia. And of course, this is the reason that these individuals have familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, what you need to understand is that uh, most of the time when you're talking about uh, mutations uh, in genes, you're talking, you're talking about loss of function mutations. In the case of PCSK9 causing familial hypercholesterolemia, this was a gain of function mutation. It was making PCSK9 work better and that was enabling uh, PCSK9 to destroy more LDL receptors and cause hypercholesterolemia. So some very smart people said, well, if there's naturally occurring gain of function mutations causing hypercholesterolemia, there's probably also some naturally occurring loss of function mutations. And that's exactly what they looked for, and that's exactly what they found. Here you can see early data from two different cohorts, one in Copenhagen and one from the Eric study in the US. And what they did is they screened individuals who had were below the fifth percentile for LDL cholesterol. In other words, these population cohorts that had very low LDL, and they screened them for loss of function mutations in PCSK9, and they found them. And what they also found is not only did they have lifelong lower LDL cholesterol, but they also had lifelong dramatic reductions in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And what I really want to point out is, you can see here, if you look at the middle column, the LDL cholesterol that's associated with these naturally occurring loss of function mutations in PCSK9 associate with fairly modest reductions in LDL cholesterol, but you can see up to 90% reduction in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And that just goes to show you that if you can keep your LDL just modestly depressed for your whole life, you don't have to have super low LDL, but if you have just a little bit below average, you basically inoculate yourself from atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is a much more effective approach to ASCVD risk reduction than waiting until midlife and then getting very, very aggressive, particularly waiting until somebody has an event and getting very, very aggressive. So the genetics certainly suggest that earlier approaches to LDL reduction uh, would be much more favorable. So, of course, uh, after seeing you know the evidence that Gain of function mutations in PCSK9 associated with severe hypercholesterolemia, familial hypercholesterolemia, and loss of function mutations associate with low LDL and lifelong reduction in ASCVD. Obviously, the pharmaceutical industry got very interested. This looked like a very uh, druggable target. I should add that those individuals with loss of function mutations in PCSK9 were otherwise healthy. There was no reason to think that this would be um, an unsafe approach to LDL cholesterol reduction. And of course, the the rest of the story, I think you know, which was the development of two fully human monoclonal antibodies targeted to PCSK9. And so what what this diagram is showing you in the upper left is that the, the antibodies that are injected as therapy, alirocumab and evolocumab, they're injected every two or every four weeks in great excess. So remember, I said that PCSK9 is a low abundance plasma protein. So it's very easy to overwhelm circulating PCSK9. You inject all these antibodies. And these antibodies will, once they get into the circulation, bind all PCSK9, but then there's a lot of unbound antibody. So as new PCSK9 is secreted into the circulation, you have antibody just ready to bind it. And so by binding up all this PCSK9 in the circulation, it prevents it from binding to the LDL receptor, which now unleashes the ability to really maximize recycling of LDL receptor, maximize the expression of LDL receptor on the surface of the cell, maximize LDL clearance from the circulation. Now you might be asking, wait a minute, the first approach to antagonizing PCSK9 is an antibody. Why aren't we just using a, you know, a, a small molecule like we always do? Well, keep that question in mind as we uh, continue to talk about this. So again, there's two fully human monoclonal antibodies, alirocumab and evolocumab. If you look at the LDL cholesterol efficacy trials, they do exactly the same. They're, they perform exactly the same. Side effect profiles exactly the same. 60 to 70 percent reductions in LDL cholesterol with alirocumab. You see exactly the same thing here with evolocumab. 60 to 70 percent reductions 
in uh, LDL cholesterol. So these are phenomenally effective LDL cholesterol lowering drugs, more effective even than the high intensity statin therapy that we already had. This culminated in 2017 and 2018 with the publications of the two dedicated cardiovascular outcome trials in 2017. Fourier was published. These are both in the New England Journal of Medicine. Fourier enrolled patients with stable atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, who were on um, um, uh, maximally tolerated statin therapy and azetamide. And in 2018, we saw the results of the Odyssey Outcomes trial, which tested alirocumab in a slightly higher risk population. These were individuals who had a prior ACS within the previous 12 months prior to randomization. In both of these studies, you could see that the PCSK9 inhibitors lowered LDL cholesterol by 60%, and we saw the exact same effect on outcomes. So you see a 15% relative risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint in both of these, so 15% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. Uh, so you can see that really the same LDL cholesterol reduction, the same improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. So we look at these antibodies therapeutically as being essentially the same. So now we have two dedicated cardiovascular outcome trials. There's no longer a doubt that these are effective uh, and useful in cardiovascular risk reduction. And so they get into the 2018 American Heart Association, American College, American College of Cardiology cholesterol guidelines. There's specific recommendations regarding to PCSK9 inhibitors. So we're supposed to consider uh, recommending PCSK9 inhibitors in patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease who are uh, whose LDL cholesterol is 70 or greater on maximally tolerated statin therapy and azetamide, and individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia who have an LDL cholesterol of 100 or greater, again, on maximally tolerated statin and azetamide. Now, more recently, we've had a, uh, a, a look at longer-term data. Um, I should point out that both Fourier and Odyssey Outcomes, the two initial cardiovascular outcome trials, uh, because the PCSK9 inhibitors were so uh, effective, and because these are event-driven trials, uh, the median duration of these trials was very short. For Fourier, it was 2.8 years. For Odyssey outcomes, it was 3.3 years. So at that point, we didn't really know what the longer-term data would look like. So at the EAC in 2022, they published the um, uh, the long-term extension uh, data. Uh, so this is now the open-label extension of the um, the Fourier trial testing evolocumab. So uh, the Fourier trial had almost 28,000 individuals in it. Of those 28,000, 6,635 participants enrolled in this open label extension. And of those, you have just over 3,000 who were originally randomized to ebolocumab in the parent study, and just over 3,000 who were randomized to placebo in the, in, uh, the parent study. So what, what we're talking about now is taking 6,600 participants from the original trial, of those 6,600 patients, some were randomized, half were randomized to evolocumab, half were randomized to placebo. And now, at the beginning of this open label extension, now they all go on to evolocumab. Okay, so now we have a longer duration of these individuals on evolocumab, and the, the median follow up in this open label extension was five years. So the maximum exposure to evolocumab in individuals who were originally randomized to evolocumab and then went into the open label was just over eight years. And what you see here in the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right is that the individuals who were originally randomized to evolocumab and then stayed on evolocumab had statistically significant lower event rates over eight years compared to people who were originally randomized to placebo and then at about three years in the open label went on to evolocumab. What it shows is that even though evolocumab is extremely effective, you can never catch up. In other words, if you delay therapy, you're not going to enjoy the same magnitude of event reduction as people who basically started evolocumab earlier. So what this implies is the mantra over the last years has really been lower is better. But the genetics and data like this from the open label extension shows that it's not just about LDL lowering, but it's the duration of LDL lowering. So ASCVD risk reduction is the magnitude of LDL lowering and the duration of LDL lowering. And that is the take home lesson of what we've learned about LDL lowering over the last 30 years. Now, the two trials that I've just mentioned, Fourier and Odyssey outcomes, were in the highest risk patients. These were in patients with established disease who had prior clinical events, MI, stroke, PAD events, and they've been proven to be very effective. So now 
obviously the next target is to look at a slightly less high risk population. So the Vesalius CV trial is testing evolocumab in patients who are at high risk for cardiovascular events, but don't have prior MI or stroke. So this includes people with a diagnosis of coronary disease who haven't had an MI, uh, diagnosis of cerebral vascular disease, but no prior stroke, PAD, but no limb events, advanced diabetes. You could even have evidence of subclinical atherosclerosis by coronary artery calcium. And uh, obviously these people are on uh, optimized statin therapy and azetamide that their LDL cholesterol is greater than 90, non-HDL cholesterol is greater than 120, or the APOB is greater than 80. They can get into the trial, then randomized to evolocumab or placebo. And um, obviously this is an event-driven trial uh, with a median follow-up of four and a half years. This is fully enrolled, um, and we expect the results uh, within the next year, year and a half. So that'll be interesting to see. Now, of course, PCSK9 inhibitors, the spirit of the development, of course, of these drugs was to lower LDL. But there's been some very interesting uh, findings. If we consider other lipid fractions beyond LDL, this was completely unanticipated. One of the observations that's been very, very consistent has been the fact that PCSK9 inhibitors are associated with reductions in lipoprotein malay. And for those of you who are not as familiar with lipoprotein malay, I'm going to give you um, a, a brief review of what that's all about. But this is you know, completely unanticipated, and we still don't actually understand how it is that PCSK9 inhibitors do reduce LPLA. But regardless of whether you're talking about, about a low dose or a high dose injection at, at two weeks or four weeks, uh, what we see is um, a very consistent 20 to 25% reduction in lipoprotein LA with um, PCSK9 inhibition. So I'm going to now just digress from our PCSK9 inhibitors and get everybody up to speed on, on what lipoprotein malay is if you're less familiar. So uh, lipoprotein malay, unfortunately, uh, suffers from a terrible name. They have a terrible PR problem. It doesn't sound like VLDL or HDL or LDL or IDL, but it really isn't that exotic. As this cartoon depicts, it's the cousin of LDL. So we're all familiar with LDL. It's this spherical lipoprotein that carries predominantly cholesterol within its core. It has this apolipoprotein B100 uh, on its surface that gives it structural in, in integrity and it also serves as the ligand for the LDL receptor. Well, lipoprotein LA is very similar. It has that same LDL-like particle, but it has this additional apolipoprotein called apolipoprotein LA or APOA for short. And it's the unique features of this APOA moiety that make it such a atherogenic particle, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a bit. But to understand that, we first need to go a little bit into the um, genetic architecture of its gene. So the gene that encodes for apolipoprotein little a is LPA. And I'm first showing you the structure of plasminogen. And the reason I'm doing that is because the LPA gene actually evolved from the plasminogen gene. The plasminogen has a protease domain. That's the business end of the molecule. Um, and then you can see it has these five Kringle domains, Kringles one through Kringle five. And below that, you see the structure of the apolipoprotein LA or LPA gene. And it has some similarities, but some very important differences from plasminogen. It too has a protease domain, although in the case of apolipoprotein LA, that is inactive. And it has Kringles four and Kringles five as plasminogen does. It doesn't have Kringles one through three. But here's where things get a little bit complicated. The Kringle four domain, um, in uh, in apolipoprotein LA has 10 subtypes, Kringle 4 subtype 1 all the way through Kringle 4 subtype 10. And to make it even more complicated than that, the Kringle 4 subtype 2 domain can have a variable number of copy repeats. So you might have only one Kringle 4 subtype 2 domain, but you can have more than 40 copies of that Kringle 4 subtype 2 domain. And this is extremely important because this produces various isoforms in the circulation depending on your genetics. So on the top left, this is uh, demonstrating somebody with a small isoform. So they have four Kringle 4 subtype 2 domains, as opposed to somebody on the bottom right who has 40 copy repeats of the Kringle 4 subtype 2 domain. And there's a very important relationship between isoform size and circulating concentrations of lipoprotein LA. What do I mean by that? Well, on uh, the top of this figure, you can see an individual who has a higher Kringle 4 subtype 2 repeat number. And because of that, because of this larger isoform, the liver, which is primarily producing that apolipoprotein, 
um, it's very inefficient. It's, it takes much longer to synthesize a longer isoform. And so there's this inverse relationship between isoform size and circulating LPLA. And uh, that is also um, emblematic on the bottom where you see an individual who has small copy number repeat of Kringle 4 subtype 2. It's very efficient for the liver to produce this isoform. And so they'll tend to have higher concentrations of LPLA. So there's this inverse relationship between isoform size, i.e. Kringle 4 subtype 2 domain repeat, and your concentration of LPLA in the blood. And this is the primary, the primary uh, determinant of your LPLA concentrations. Unlike LDL cholesterol, whose blood levels are under both environmental and genetic control, LPLA concentrations are predominantly under genetic control. And the major genetic control is the Kringle 4 subtype 2 copy number variation. Now, there are some non-genetic influences on LPLA. It's not completely genetic. It's primarily genetic, but not complete. And so individuals with uh, end-stage liver disease, they tend to have lower levels of LPLA. Individuals with hypothyroidism, that's untreated. They'll have higher levels of LPLA. In women who enter the menopause and estrogen levels wane, you'll see LPLA concentrations going up modestly. But actually, the most important and the most common non-genetic factor that influences LPLA level is GFR. As GFR goes down, LPLA concentration goes up. Important to understand that lifestyle changes really have no material impact on LPLA concentrations. That's not to say that in individuals with high LPLA that we don't recommend healthy lifestyle. We, of course, take a risk-based approach, and lifestyle has many important uh, aspects beyond just LPLA. But if you put somebody on a healthy diet and you put somebody on a physical uh, on a good uh, physical activity regimen, don't expect to see their LPLA changing. It's just still fairly steady. So what makes LPLA such a, a nasty particle? Well, uh, again, we need to remember there's this LDL-like particle. So just like a garden variety LDL, when an LPLA gets into the arterial wall, it's delivering its cholesterol payload. It's delivering the cholesterol to plaque. But again, it's the unique features of APOA, which is probably making it more atherogenic than a standard LDL particle. So number one, apolipoprotein LA appears to be this plasma repository, this sink, for oxidized phospholipids. So when the LPLA crashes into the arterial wall, it's not only delivering cholesterol, it's delivering these highly inflammatory oxidized phospholipids, which will cause plaque inflammation and make them more vulnerable to rupture. And then finally, as I showed you, apolipoprotein LA, the LPA gene, shares homology with plasminogen. So at least in theory, it can be a prothrombotic particle. So it's got cholesterol, it's got oxidized phospholipids, and potentially prothrombotic. So a lot of um, a lot of mechanisms by which LPLA could be associated with atherothrombotic events. Now, LDL cholesterol levels uh, in the population follow, follow a normal distribution, a uh, bell-shaped curve. Uh, LPLA, on the other hand, is a very skewed distribution. So the vast majority of people will have normal LPLA levels. They'll have low LPLA. But about 20% of the population will have a level of LPLA that is actually putting them at risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And I just said 20% of the population, if you look globally, well, now we're talking about 1.4 billion people have an LPLA that's putting them at risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and in fact, calcific aortic valve stenosis, and it's hiding in plain sight, mostly because we're not doing screening in a systematic fashion. So, um, you know, getting back to a, a related issue, uh, I mentioned that the PCS9 inhibitors have been associated with this 20 to 25 percent reduction in LPLA. That seemed to be a surprise, but I guess we shouldn't have been so surprised because there was already genetic data that suggested that patients with loss of function mutations in PCSK9, which would be the genetic equivalent of PCSK9 inhibition, not only had lower LDLs, but they had lower LPLA. So this is reinforced by the genetics. Well, what about the epidemiology? Well, there is a very clear direct relationship of LPLA and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. This is in a fully adjusted model. You can see as LPLA goes up, so too does the risk of uh, CHD and stroke. The genetics is uh, exactly the same, so the observational and the genetic epidemiology are uh, completely in sync. Genetically predicted LPLA concentrations uh, associated with increased odds of both CHD and stroke. And if we look at the genetic determinants of coronary artery disease, LPLA is at the, at, at the top of the list. In terms of the magnitude of association 
of a genetic signal and CHD, LPLA is the most potent predictor. And actually, it turns out pretty much the same thing for PAD. You may have been taught in, in, in medical school or during residency. The only individuals who get PAD are individuals who either have diabetes or smoke. Well, we can add LPLA to the list. LPLA is the most potent genetic signal in predicting peripheral arterial disease stronger than all other genes. So the case is pretty clear from both the observational and the genetic epidemiology as LPLA levels go up. So too does risk of CHD, stroke, PAD, calcific aortic valve stenosis. What we've been missing are the randomized controlled trials that demonstrate if you take somebody with high LPLA and you lower the LPLA levels with the drug, that that necessarily improves cardiovascular outcomes. The reason we haven't had those trials is because we haven't had drugs that have been potent enough to lower LPLA. That is completely changing, but that is a topic for another day. So let us get back to the uh, uh, to the main discussion, which we were talking about. We ended here talking about this very consistent relationship of PCSK9 inhibitor monoclonal antibodies and LPLA reduction. So what have we seen then in the large cardiovascular outcome trials that have re reviewed with you? Here is the data from Fourier. This is the large cardiovascular outcome trial tested ebolocumab again. It lowered LDL cholesterol by 60%, so a 27% reduction in LPLA. Now, when they stratified these individuals by baseline LPLA, either below the median or above the median, and here we're just using the median level. This is not a high level of LPLA, what we would consider in the clinic elevated. This is just above or below the median. You can see that the individuals who had above median LPLA at baseline seem to garner a greater benefit from the use of evolocumab. So it, it appears that the LPLA also tags individuals who are going to get greater benefit from the PCSK9 inhibitor. And this may be something we need to keep in mind when we're on the fence about should we start somebody on a PCSK9 inhibitor or not. Perhaps testing LPLA there can be very helpful. But I think this post hoc analysis from the Odyssey Outcomes Trial really helps to extend that thinking. They basically asked the question, is there a benefit of PCSK9 inhibition on top of optimized statin therapy when the LDL cholesterol is about 70? This happens all the time. We have somebody on, say, maximally tolerated statin therapy, maybe with azetamide. They have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Is it worth it to add the PCSK9 inhibitor if the LDL is already pretty well controlled? Well, these investigators did a post hoc analysis of Odyssey Outcomes, that's the cardiovascular outcome trial testing alirocumab. And in Odyssey Outcomes, there was basically two screening LDL cholesterols. And what they found is there was about just over 4,000 individuals who at one of their screenings actually had an LDL cholesterol of less than 70. To get into the trial, you needed to have an LDL cholesterol greater than 70. But 4,000 individuals, at least in one of those screening, had an LDL cholesterol less than 70. Now, if you looked at those individuals, it was pretty close to 70. Their median LDL cholesterol was 69. And then the balance of the trial participants, 14,000, had LDL cholesterol is greater than 70. Their median LDL value was 94. And they evaluated the effects of alirocumab according to baseline LPLA levels. And again, looking at median levels, in this case, it was 13.7 milligrams per deciliter. That is not a high LPLA, you know, where we would start to think about risk is at 50 milligrams per deciliter or higher. So this median level of LPLA of just 13.7 is not particularly elevated. So with that in mind, I want you to pay attention to just the top half of this figure. What they looked at now are individuals who had LDLs at around 70 or below, according to median LPLA level. So here you have well-treated patients, LDL at goal, and individuals whose LPLA was below median, they didn't benefit from the addition of the PCSK9 inhibitor. But in individuals whose baseline LPLA was greater than median, they actually had statistically significant reductions from the addition of alirocumab. So again, I think this provides some evidence that when you're on the fence about starting a PCSK9 inhibitor, because you have somebody's LDL pretty well controlled, you might be able to use LPLA as an answer. Now, I want to talk about an alternative approach to PCSK9 inhibition. What we've been talking about so far are the fully human monoclonal antibodies targeted to PCSK9. That's what's demonstrated on the top right of this figure. This is an approach where we inject an antibody, that antibody binds all circulating PCSK9. But there's a new approach, a gene silencing approach using a small interfering RNA that basically stops the translation of PCSK9 mRNA. So this 
small interfering RNA therapeutic gets into the cell and stops the translation of PCSK9 protein. So very, very different approach. This, of course, is in Clesiran. Now, the first thing that you need to know is all of the antisense oligonucleotides, all the small interfering RNAs that are used for lipid therapeutics today, and there are many of them, and there are many in the pipeline, they all use something called the GALNAC conjugate. Um, GALNAC, it basically stands, to, stands for N-acetylgalactosamine. And you then have this, whatever small interfering RNA or ASO of interest, it's conjugated to this GALNAC. And the reason for that is the liver has a conjugate receptor called the ASGPR receptor, and GALNAC binds to that. It's important to understand that this ASGPR receptor is only expressed in hepatocytes. Okay, and since most of the metabolism, lipid metabolism is happening in the liver, this is a very effective way of targeting a lipid therapeutic to where you want it to go, which allows you to bring down the dose dramatically, up to 90% reductions in the dose when you use this GALNET conjugate. So this is a way of very efficiently targeting uh, the, uh, the drug to where you want. So in this case, it's in is, tar is is conjugated to GALNET, gets in the liver very, very efficiently. So now you have this small interfering RNA directed to the liver and the antisense strand. Remember, the small interfering RNA is a double stranded RNA. The antisense strand is loaded into the RNA induced silencing complex called the RISC uh, in the hepatocyte. And that complex then binds to the PCSK9 mRNA, leading to its degradation and preventing protein translation. That's the way this works. So what are the key differences between the antibodies and the small interfering RNA? As I've mentioned, for the monoclonal antibodies, you're basically binding the PCSK9 that inhibits its ability to bind to the LDL receptor. The small interfering RNA prevents the translation of the PCSK9 protein. The antibody is a purely extracellular approach, whereas the small interfering RNA is a hepatocyte-specific intracellular approach. But at a practical level, probably what's most important, certainly to our patients, is that the antibodies are generally injected every two weeks. Whereas the small interfering every uh, the small interfering RNA is twice a year, very very different injection frequency. So I want to talk about the clinical development program within Clisaran, the small interfering RNA. I'm going to focus on the phase three um, LDL lowering efficacy trials, as you can see here, circled in red. Those are the Orion nine, ten, and eleven trials. And Orion nine uh, was testing in Clisaran in patients with heterozygous FH whereas 10 and 11 uh, were uh, grouped together. They were trials of enclisterin in patients with hypercholesterolemia. Uh, these were both published in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine three years ago. Here are the specific study inclusions. As I said, Orion 9 was specifically a heterozygous FH trial, patients on maximally tolerant lipid-lowering therapy with LDLs greater than 100. Orion 10 was an ASCVD trial, so LDL cholesterols had to be above 70 on maximally tolerated baseline uh, lipid-lowering therapy, and Orion 11 was a mixed group of ASCVD and high-risk primary prevention. And so the LDL threshold to get in vary depending on their risk status. Now, Orion's 9, 10, and 11 were specifically designed so that all of the data could be pooled. And here is the pooled patient level analysis of inclisarad amongst three, three, stu three studies. You can see that the median age was 65, about 40% were from the United States, two thirds were men, a little over a third had diabetes. Uh, um, the vast majority of these patients were on statins and baseline LDL cholesterol was about 111 milligrams per deciliter. So what are the results? This is looking at the use of inclycerin over 18 months. And uh, the dosing strategy, if you haven't used inclycerin, is such that you get your first dose at baseline, time zero, then three months later, 90 days later, you get dose number two. And from that point, you go to every six months to every 180 days. So here you're looking at uh, four dose administrations. You're seeing a time averaged LDL cholesterol uh, reduction of about 50% uh, with inclycerin in this population. So of course, they looked at other uh, lipid parameters. You can see that circulating PCS canine levels went down by 83% non-HDL cholesterol by 46%, ApoB by 42%. And look at this, again, lipoprotein delay going down with some kind of PCSK9 inhibition by 20%. Uh, safety and tolerability was excellent. Uh, really, the only places where you see some imbalance is more arthralgias, 
um, with uh, inclisiran. And of course, injection site reactions, as you would get with any injectable, were higher in the inclisiran group uh, than they were with placebo. But importantly, no evidence of liver, kidney, muscle, or platelet toxicity. Here's the phase two open label extension called Orion 3. This is the open label extension of the Orion 1 trial. And the big deal about this is this is you now four years worth of drug. And you can see that really the LDL cholesterol reduction was sustained 44% reduction over four years with twice yearly dosing. So this is really quite remarkable. And really up until now, I would summarize this by saying that Inclisiran is durable, provides potent LDL cholesterol reduction with only twice yearly injection, excellent safety pro profile even in this high risk population. And of course, for patients, we think it enhances the convenience and, and potentially adherence, which is a, obviously a huge issue when it comes to treating um, asymptomatic chronic conditions like hypercholesterolemia. Well, what about the cardiovascular outcome trials? Well, unfortunately, Orion 4, which was the large phase three dedicated cardiovascular outcome trial, was started um, about a year and a half prior to the pandemic. And you can imagine what happened to many randomized controlled trials uh, as uh, you know the COVID situation uh, was going on, going on. So unfortunately, uh, they couldn't get new patients into the study. Many patients who were already in didn't want to come in for follow-up. So Orion 4 is still going on, uh, but they've lost the number of patients and it's been very, very slow. So they actually had to start a dedicated cardiovascular outcomes trial after this, you know, things calmed down with the pandemic. This is called Victorian to Prevent. It's a very similar design as Orion 4, as um, Fourier, which was with the PCSK9 inhibitor antibodies, basically taking patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with prior events on maximized uh, statin therapy whose LDL cholesterol remains greater than 70, getting randomized to inclisiran versus placebo. Uh, this trial is fully enrolled, and so we'll have the answer probably in two to three years. But while we're waiting to see the results, uh, we have some uh, some data to at least think about. This is uh, a look at inclisiran and cardiovascular events uh, from the phase three trials. Important to remember, you know, now you're looking at data from trials that were not powered for events. So we have to be a little bit careful how we interpret this. But basically, it does suggest that the LDL lowering with inclisiran was associated with about 23% reduction in uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, so certainly trending in the right direction, obviously would need to see the final data from Victorian too, but certainly what we've learned with LDL lowering that anything that can lower LDL safely uh, should be associated with cardiovascular event reduction. So we're anticipating positive trial data with Victorian to prevent. So there are many other uh, therapeutics uh, being developed uh, in the PCSK9 pipeline besides what we've already talked about, including small molecule inhibitors. So this is where we should have started, right? <laughs> I made I made a comment very early on. Why the heck are we starting with antibodies? Do we ever start a new drug development with antibodies? And the answer is no. Of course, we, we always start with small molecule inhibitors because it's the most cost-effective way to go. Antibody production is extremely expensive. And that's why PCSK9 inhibitors have historically been quite expensive. Um, the issue has been that uh, it's been difficult to design small molecules to inhibit this PCSK9 LDL receptor protein protein interaction interface. Uh, apparently, uh, it's very flat and featureless. It doesn't have a pocket or groove for ligand binding. And it's been very hard then to design a small molecule to actually inhibit PCSK9 from binding to the LDL receptor. Um, but fortunately, with advances in medicinal chemistry, now there are a number of very promising small molecules. The one that's furthest in, in development is MK0616, which is uh, Merck's small molecule. Uh, this is data that was presented um, at the American College of Cardiology meeting this year, which basically shows that um, in this dose raging study compared to placebo, very significant uh, reductions in LDL cholesterol. And at the two higher doses, you see a 60% reduction in LDL cholesterol which mimics exactly what we see with the PCSK9 inhibitor monoclonal antibody. So it's LDL cholesterol efficacy uh, seems to be preserved even as a small molecule inhibitor. So this is now um, in a, a phase three clinical development. Here are the three phase three studies that are ongoing. There's the outcome study called coral reef outcomes. Uh, there's one being done in patients with garden variety hypercholesterolemia. 
uh, called coral reef lipids, and then a dedicated study in heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And we will have these um, results of, of the ones just looking at LDL lowering efficacy in two years, and of course the outcomes trial in, in several years. But perhaps the, the most interesting, most exciting, borderline sci-fi development is what's going on uh, with gene editing. Uh, in, in, in the case of pcs 9 it's actually single base editing. Of course, you've all heard about CRISPR-based techniques, and there's uh, many therapeutics that are uh, going in this direction, uh, but this is now very advanced uh, with pcs 9 So this is not pcs 9 gene editing. This is a single base editing for pcs 9 Basically, the idea is to cause a loss of function mutation in pcs 9 uh, we know that there are people who are very healthy who are you know genetically endowed with loss of function mutations in PCSK9 who have lower LDLs and don't develop cardiovascular disease. And so this is essentially what we're trying to mimic with this therapeutic. And what you can see here, at least in a, a non-human primate model, by um, causing this um, single uh, base change, 90% reductions in circulating PCSK9, 60% reductions in LDL cholesterol, very, very impressive. In terms of safety, of course, with gene editing or base editing, what we're always worried about is um, affecting, um, you know, having off-target effects. We don't want this to affect the germline. We want just the somatic mutation. We don't want this to be carried on from generation to generation. So again, in non-human primate models, you can see that sequencing of sperm samples of male uh, monkeys and genotyping of offspring from treated mice, female mice, indicated no evidence of germline editing of PCSK9. And because of the efficacy, because of the safety, and again, remember, this is a single infusion of this medication. This is one and done. This has supported the um, initiation of a first in human trial. And the first subject was actually dosed with this, uh, with VERB 101, this base editing um, therapeutic uh, in, in, in 2022 in New Zealand. And now this is happening in, in the UK and the United States, and it's called the HEART-1 clinical trial, which is testing VERB 101. And you can see from the schematic that it has three components. And um, at the end of this year, we actually may have the first human data testing this approach. So very, very exciting. So I, I hope I've given you a sense of the evolution of LDL lowering therapies, of statins, to oral combination therapies, to monoclonal antibodies, to small interfering RNA, to potentially gene editing. We have come a long way, and we've been able to achieve um, dramatic LDL cholesterol reduction. We can get LDLs to where we want in even the most challenging patients at this point. It's been really uh, a, a remarkable revolution in um, drug discovery. So uh, the discovery of PCSK9 and its ensuing development as a target of therapy has really transformed the management of patients, even the most challenging patients with hypercholesterolemia. The therapeutic monoclonal antibodies to PCSK9 have shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes. In Clesiran, which is an, a small interfering RNA approach to preventing production of PCSK9, is safe and effective and is already at use in the clinic for lowering LDL cholesterol. And additional exciting approaches that I've just shared with you to antagonizing PCSK9 are in development. So I will end there. It's been really wonderful to uh, to speak with you this morning, and I would be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. This was great. Uh, thank you for especially simplifying LDL metabolism for us. <laughs> we all tend to forget that, and I think uh, uh, the second year fellows and people who are giving the boards will really appreciate those Super. figures you mentioned. Um, I think we have uh, questions coming into the chat, but till we have that, I do have a, a question. In our garden variety diabetes patient, do you recommend checking LP little a? People who are already on a statin, maybe yeah. a lower or a mid moderate dose statin at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. LP little a is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I will tell you my own personal opinion, and uh, and then I'll tell you what the guidelines suggest. Um, my personal opinion is I check LPLA in everyone um, once. It only needs to be checked once because, um, as I mentioned, it's primarily genetically determined. So since your genes don't change, the levels are pretty much stable from two-year-old onward. 
you know, so you have your adult levels very, very early on. And you only need to really check it once to identify with whether LPLA related risk is present or not. And you'd say, well, checking everybody, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it is the most common inherited dyslipidemia. You need to test five people in order to find one person who's at risk that you would have no idea otherwise was at risk. You cannot intuit an individual's LPLA by looking at their total cholesterol or their LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol or triglycerides, a completely independent risk factor. If you don't measure it, you'll never know. 20% of the population has a level that puts them at risk. So for me, I would check everyone. I will tell you that the European Society of Cardiology, European Atherosclerosis Society, put out a new consensus recommendation regarding LPLA measurement just in 2022. They said, measure it everyone. The Canadians, since 2021, their recommendations are measured in everyone. So the United States is a little bit behind, at least with regards to the 2018 HAACC recommendation. They measure LPLA as a risk enhancing factor, something that you can consider measuring when your risk estimation is uncertain and you want more information. Uh, but they've fallen short with regards to specific recommendations about LPLA. I'll tell you in the US, if you look at other professional society guidelines like the National Lipid Association and other like minded uh, uh, guidelines, they again also fall short uh, about you know, making that recommendation to screen everyone where there's no controversy is when there's a family history of early atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. You know, that suggests a genetic component. There, everybody agrees, check the LPLA, or if somebody comes to you as a young person and has already had a stent or a heart attack or a stroke, check LPLA. I think you could make the case, as I showed you before, now if you're on the fence about starting a PCS canine inhibitor, the information that you get from LPLA can help you decide whether it might be worthwhile. Um, so those, those would be some areas where there's really no controversy, but I suspect that the U.S. will probably come to where many other countries have come to uh, already, which is uh, screening once in a lifetime. So getting to your question specifically about diabetics, there's no specific um, recommendation in diabetics about measuring LPLA. This may be of interest to you, though. Uh, there is an inverse association between diabetes and LPLA. Patients with diabetes tend to have lower LPLA levels. And this is a very consistent observation. Uh, we see this in all of the population-based studies. One of the concerns about the drugs that are now being developed for LPLA lowering, it, because they're so potent, some of them lower LPLA almost by 100%. One of the concerns is if you lower LPLA too much, will we see an increase in diabetes? It remains to be determined, but that is on people's mind. And then it comes a question, which is worse, to have high LPLA or to have some increase in incident diabetes. So those need to be reconciled, but that is a specific issue with regards to LPLA and diabetes. Now, you mentioned you check it in everybody. So what cutoff do you use and how does it change whether yes. you're going to put them on a statin or something different? Yes, that is a great question. I'm glad you asked. So this is where it gets confusing because there are two different, there are many different assays, but there's two primary assays that are used in the United States. One is called the mass assay, and that the units of measurement are milligrams per deciliter. The threshold there would be 50 or greater milligrams per deciliter. The better assay and the more commonly used one now is molar concentration uh, measured in uh, nanomoles per liter, and there the threshold is 125. Unfortunately, you can't convert between the two. People have come up with conversion factors, but they don't work well. Um, so even though the molar concentration is 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 better, some you know, and people are tempted to convert the milligrams per deciliter to the nanomoles per liter. You really can't do that. Regardless, both assays work reasonably well, at least for clinical use. Uh, so whichever one you are using is fine. Um, in terms of how does it uh, change your management? Well, of course, it does reclassify risk upwards if they're above these thresholds. And what we would do there, obviously, beyond uh, trying to emphasize lifestyle, is probably shooting for lower LDL. We would be more aggressive about treating LDL, we would start statins earlier. And this happens all the time in my clinic where I see a young person because there's family history, they're worried, we measure an LPLA, they're 30 years old, their LPLA is high. We might even start thinking about, even if they don't have other risk factors, we might start thinking about, at least we'll have a conversation about, should we start a statin now? And that, of course, you're talking about lifelong. Um, but the other issue, and this is something that's critical, and I think because I hear a lot about, well, there's no therapy for LPLA, so why should we even measure it? Well, one is 
you're, you're, you're going to be more emphatic about risk reduction, including potentially statins. But the other thing is because of its genetic nature, you're going to have to screen all the first degree family members. Everybody's going to need to be tested for LPLA. So it does matter. It does make a difference. It does change your management. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zhang, you have a question or comment? Please unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Um, so here about all this uh, new um, uh, you know, uh, discoveries and pharmaceutical developments from Dr. Shapiro, um, it makes me thinking of a, a similar situation in the obesity world. You know, we have new agents coming out and in, in a question from two standpoints. And one is like um, being uh, having so many patients access the issue um, from a practical standpoint, you know, in, in the obesity world, we're trying to figure out you know, it, it's kind of too much burden for primary care doctors to handle this uh, issue now. And uh, also we don't have enough providers to uh, see all these patients. How about for, you know, for a lipid problems as well? Um, even it's probably even more complicated for a general cardiologist or a typical cardiology clinic to handle yep. this, I'm thinking of. Um, so this is one. And two is uh, how about you know, coverage for these new agents? Um, yep. we, we, we have the same situation here. Yes, those are great questions, Wei. Thank you. So the, 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 uh, the first question, I, I really like the first part of that question, which is, you know, how are you going to deal with all these patients who potentially would benefit from these drugs? So I've been pushing for preventive cardiology for a long time, and it's been very, very difficult because, you know, many cardiologists or, you know, many people in internal medicine would say, well, I can prescribe atorvastatin and aspirin just like you can. Why do you, why do you pretend that you have some kind of subspecialty called preventive cardiology? Well, now, based on what I've just shared with you and many, many more things going on with therapeutics beyond lipid management that affect atherosclerotic risk and a lot of diagnostics that are very helpful and that have developed it has helped us to understand that there is a need for a subspecialty of cardiology that is just focused on prevention, just like there's a need for a specialty that's just focused on obesity. I think you would probably share the same view about that. In terms of coverage, this has been a, a major issue. And in fact, the PCS cannot inhib inhibitor monoclonal antibodies in 2015 put this in very clear focus because just before their approval, all of us who were interested in lipid management had lists of patients who we thought would be perfect, to set, particularly our FH patients, you know, for these drugs, only to find out that when they were approved, no, none of these people could get access to the medication, even though these were really developed for this purpose. Of course, um, there was a huge fallout from that. Uh, and then, of course, since the advent of the randomized controlled trials during the improved um, uh, cardiovascular outcomes, and then a 60% price reduction because of serious pressure on the manufacturers, uh, it has become now widely available and um, easily uh, approved. It's no longer an issue like it used to be. And for uh, Inclisiran, interestingly, Medicare covers that, <laughs> uh, whereas they don't cover the monoclonal and antibodies so well. So we, so we do have pretty good access now to some form of PCS kind of inhibition, but, but your point is well taken. With what's going on in in diabetes and lipids and obesity, you know, there's all of these new therapies and many patients are eligible for all of these therapies, right? So you can't keep piling up expensive drugs. And so the holy grail becomes which drug is the most important for which patient? And we're not there yet. We don't know how to prioritize necessarily which is the most important when you can't give people five very, very expensive drugs. It's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, no, thank you very much. Um, that's very helpful. Just a quick follow up on your. Uh, if you see a patients with uh, high lipoprotein A level and uh, uh, you're trying to, you know, either starting to lower their cardiovascular risk, it, it what is the target of our LDL for that population? Would you target? Uh, let's say it's for primary prevention. Yeah, great question. Nobody knows. I can tell you what I do uh, in primary prevention. If if, if, page, if the patient is uh, appropriate enough. Uh, I would do a coronary calcium score. Uh, and uh, if there's evidence of coronary calcium, then I would, you know, try to push the LDLs to very low levels. If they're very young and their coronary calcium score of zero is, we, you know, there's some flexibility in what to do. Not, you know, uh, all of these risk factors are probabilistic, not deterministic. Just because you have high LPLA does not necessarily mean you would develop ASCVD, but you're at significantly higher risk. We talk about that. 
some people if their calcium score is zero is going to say I, I don't want to take a statin for the rest of my life and i say fine but maybe we should rescan you every five years and as long as you're zero you don't need to do that uh, but as soon as you develop coronary calcium that would be our threshold for starting a statin others say hey i never want to develop ACVD. i understand my coronary calcium score is zero i want to keep it that way give me the give me the statin and and that's fine so it's really shared decision making Thank you so much. I think the compliments are pouring in in the chat and there are a couple of questions as well. Uh, the first one from Dr. Del Rincon is, is there an LDL level that would prompt you to scale down on the intensity of treatment to reduce it? That is a wonderful question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Uh, I didn't have time to show, but I will share with you um, that finally we have you know, the data to answer questions like this. There's been a theoretical concern for a long time is there an LDL that's too low? Uh, and there's there's theoretical reasons to be concerned about that. But what the PCSK9 inhibitor trials have finally been able to show is that probably not. Um, so Fourier, which I mentioned is, was a gigantic trial, was almost 28,000 patients. Because it was so large, and because PCSK9 inhibitors are so effective at lowering LDL, there was a significant proportion of individuals who achieved single digit LDLs. Yes, that is an LDL cholesterol between one to nine milligrams per deciliter. In Fourier, 500 patients got to that level. That's what I would call a low LDL cholesterol. And when they looked at these individuals specifically, and they compared them to individuals who had an LDL of 100 or greater, they found that there was no difference in serious adverse events. There was no difference in side effects between those with single digit LDLs and those with normal LDLs quote unquote, normal LDLs. Uh, so uh, there was one important difference between those two groups. The one difference is the individuals who had single digit LDLs had the lowest events of cardiovascular uh, disease, less MIs, less strokes, less PAD events. So there was no difference in serious adverse events, no difference in side effects, but there were lower atherosclerotic events in those with single digit LDLs. So what I am not suggesting is that we target an LDL-5. That is not what I'm suggesting. But if patients land there, we don't get concerned. Now, I think what the individual who posed this question is really asking is, OK, fine, it's safe if somebody gets to a, an LDL of 7, but what do you do in clinical practice with that? Um, I, I actually give patients options. Um, most of the time, I say, you know, if you want, um, we can either you know, take a drug off like azetamide, let's say, or we could lower the dose of the statin. We tend not to, to play with the PCSK9 inhibitor um, because that's going to be the most effective medication that we have. But most patients are very glad if they can lower the dose of the statin or come off the azetamide. Or sometimes it's even coming off the statin if they're not on azetamide. Um, but then other patients who I, uh, who I basically share that same information that I just shared with you, they said, well, if, if you have the lowest rates of cardiovascular events, what LDL is lowest, I don't want to change anything. That's the minority of patients, but that option exists. And uh, it appears to be perfectly safe. Thank you. I think Dr. Landholm had also put a question in the chat kind of on the same lines about LDL lowering gold. So that's good to know that we it's all in the controversy phase at this time, but there have been no side effects from LDL lowering. Correct. Um, Dr. Del Rincon is also asking, how strong is really the outcomes evidence to justify a widespread use of acetamide pipe? Oh, OK. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so the uh, Improve It trial, uh, which was the the trial of simvastatin plus azetamide versus simvastatin plus placebo in post ACS patients, was really what put azetamide on the map. It took a very long time. Azetamide had been around for a very long time, but nobody was using it until this cardiovascular outcomes trial came out. That demonstrated that the use of azetamide was associated. Uh, with uh, improvements in cardiovascular outcome. It was basically the first combination therapy, combination with statin uh, that actually was positive, you know, statin ice and statin fibrates. Those were negative trials. Finally, we have a trial of statin and azetamide, which is positive. It also added to the mantra that lower LDL is better. Um, but it was very incremental. It, it took uh, seven years uh, of that trial going on before they saw a very modest but statistically significant reduction in events. Um, Azetamide got a lifeline actually when the PCSK9 inhibitors were approved because all the payers said, 
you need to have somebody in the statin, and then you need to have them on three months of azetamibe and test their LDL again before it will approve this PCS9 inhibitor. They knew that the azetamibe was not going to get the patient to the goal, but it gives them three months where they don't have to pay for the PCS9 inhibitor. That you know that's what happened. Um, that's generally not the case anymore. You know, there's been a lot of pressure on payers. Now it's basically if you're on maximally tolerated statin therapy and you're nowhere near where you need to be for LDL, now they approve you know, the PCS canine inhibitors. So I think there's a limited role for azetamibe. Some patients don't want to go on injectable drugs. Azetamibe is generic. It's extremely well tolerated. So we still use it. As you know, there's another oral agent called bempedoic acid, uh, which is um, another uh, modestly effective drug. Azetamibe generally associated with about a 20% reduction in LDL. Bempedoic acid, about a 25%. The spirit of the development of bempedoic acid is basically uh, for patients with statin intolerance, bempedoic acid um, is a prodrug, doesn't get in into uh, into muscle, so it's very very well tolerated. The combination of azetamibe and bempedoic acid gives you a 40% LDL plus cell reduction. So for patients who don't want to go on an injectable like an antibody or small interfering RNA, we can go with those. The irony though is that bempedoic acid being a newer drug, the out of pocket expense for most patients is much worse than a PCSK9 inhibitor. So we, we generally are using statins and PCSK9 inhibitors in the vast majority of our patients. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are six minutes past eight. So I think we have a lot of people who have to go to the clinic. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. This was wonderful. And I really appreciated the lesson in physiology along with medications and pathology. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.